Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. And a special thanks to Jim Yoke, the new manager of the Office of Emergency Services at the City of Richmond. Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for being with us. Please let us know about your plans for preparedness for the city and the residents. OK, well, thanks for inviting me. Uh, this presentation is uh, it's got information in it that I've been working on for the last two months or so. Um, I was hired uh, in the middle of June. So I've been on board for about two and a half months or so. I've been spending that time doing a lot of assessing and evaluating and trying to figure out uh, what what's working and what what's not working and, and where emphasis is needed. And so this is uh, in many respects, the culmination of all of that observation uh, that I've been doing for the last uh, two and a half months. Um, this presentation is uh, going to be different, I'm sure, uh, six months from now or a year from now or something like that. Uh, probably even less time than that, actually. Uh, because this is, this is naturally a subject that uh, changes and evolves over time. So uh, it's, it's like a continual conversation. Uh, so that's something I want everybody to keep in mind. Now, what I'd like to do tonight is um, get through the presentation um, uh, pretty much nonstop. Uh, if you have if you have questions and they're like quickie little covers uh, questions, go ahead and and ask whenever you feel like it. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to do is get through it, and then at the end we can have some serious discussion about everything that I've brought up and things that you find interesting or you have questions about. Um, there's a lot of data in here, a lot of information. So uh, get ready, you're going to get a lot of stuff here. So first off, there's me and my contact information. And uh, this is at the end of the presentation as well. So don't worry about scribbling it down right now. Um, if, you're, uh, if you don't have a pen in your hand, you'll get a chance to see that again. Um, but I put it up there because I want to be accessible. Uh, my whole career, I have emphasized being available and putting myself out there. There have been times when people said, oh, you, people might call you. <laughs> and I say, well, that's the point. <laughs> I, think, I want them to be able to call me. So it's a okay. Never feel hesitant about uh, giving me a phone call or sending me an email or a text. Uh, who am I? Who is this guy? Where did he come from? How did we end up with him? Well, I've got three chapters in life. Uh, chapter one was growing up in Corvallis, Oregon, one of the most wonderful places in the world. Uh, I then lived in San Diego uh, for 18 years, where I uh, got my degree and where I found out, totally by accident actually, uh, uh, about this profession called emergency management. It was not something that I planned on doing, it's something that I sort of fell into. I think somebody was looking out for me because it's, it's been terrific. Um, after 18 years in San Diego, I've been here in the Bay Area for 15 years and counting. And things, just weird things that I thought I'd throw out there. I, uh, I enjoy languages, I speak several. Um, I am mm. in history, philosophy, music. Uh, if you ever need somebody to do the national anthem at your uh, next conference or convention, just let me know. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been told by some people in the EOC that my official EOC position is in the kitchen where I can bake things. Um, I garden in the backyard, I like woodworking, and I'm a big sports fan. Lots of stuff we could talk about at, at our leisure, but that's kind of my story very quickly. Uh, my professional background, um, I started out with the American Red Cross in San Diego. Um, started out as a volunteer, uh, then became an employee, and then went back to being a volunteer, and I've been a volunteer ever since. Uh, when they brought me on board, I was responsible for uh, disaster planning, um, community disaster education, which is you know getting out into the public, and, and in the case of San Diego and Imperial counties, trying to get three million people ready for a disaster. Uh, and then government liaison work, which I've been doing my entire career, uh, working with local, county, state, and the federal government a lot. Um, I then went to the San Diego County Office of Education for a couple of years doing emergency planning for schools, which was fascinating because uh, I had the exposure to the Red Cross and everything that came with that, but then learning about how schools perceive emergency planning and the differences uh, was fascinating to me and, and it's something that's stayed with me ever since. 
uh, the realization sunk in very quickly that emergency planning is a different subject depending upon the type of agency that you're working from. And that's something that I've, I've uh, learned at every stop along the way. Um, I then came up here to the Bay Area, yay, and I was with the Santa Clara County Fire Department um, for uh, quite a few, 11 years, uh, serving Cupertino, Campbell, Los Gatos, Montesorino, Caratoga, Los Altos Hills, and Los Altos, uh, doing all aspects of emergency planning there. I then went to, I, then I learned some more new things. I went to the Chabot Las Pasitas Community College District, and uh, Chabot College is in Hayward, Las Pasitas is in my office was in between the two in Dublin, and I got to learn all about higher education emergency management. But also, I picked up uh, a lot of OSHA information and, and workplace safety information. And I, I was the workplace safety guy for the district, and that was very educational. So every stop along the way, I've, I've learned new things. And then here I am now, been here for two and a half months, plan to be here for years and years. And years. So what are we out to accomplish tonight, or what am I... What am I trying to accomplish tonight uh, with you? And the answer is, well, I want to let you folks in Richmond know what we're doing over here. This is important. This is your city. This you, you should know. You should know what your city is up to, especially in this particular subject. So that's the main purpose. Uh, but also, I want to uh, do a couple of things. I hope, hope I will be inspirational uh, in getting you to do things in your own home and in your own neighborhood. And I know I'm speaking to a group of people who are already busy doing that. Uh, but also I want you to think about uh, being a volunteer for the city in some one respect or another. And I'm gonna show you lots of different ways of doing that. But, but even if you don't do that, you people in your neighborhood, in your organization uh, that uh, is led by Sohela is, sh should be partners with, with me and this office. We should be working together as, as partner entities. And so that's the other thing I want to get through. The message here is I want to work with you. I want to work with you as individuals. I also want to work with you as an, an organization in uh, El Sobrante. What about public safety? Here's, uh, this is just a conceptual thing that I want to make sure everybody's good on. Um, I talk about it as a four-legged stool. Uh, depending upon the organization, it might be, or it also might be a three-legged stool. Um, but when we think of public safety, I think of fire services. Uh, I think of law enforcement, I think of emergency medical, and then there's us in emergency management, my little world. Uh, the reason sometimes it's a three-legged stool is because quite frequently emergency medical and fire services are coming from the same office, the same department. Um, but in emergency management, we're the ones who plan, we train, we exercise, we coordinate, we manage, we organize recovery, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what people like me so I, I sometimes when I tell people I'm an emergency manager and they look at me and they, they don't understand exactly what I'm saying, uh, to make it understandable, I'll tell them, think of FEMA at the local level, and that's me. And then they say, oh, okay, and then they get it, all right? Now, there's a lot of emergency management material in the news right now. We're getting it every single day when you turn on the news. You're seeing emergency management in, here in California, the Calder fire and the, and the uh, Dixie fire and all the other fires. Uh, the firefighters are obviously the ones uh, doing the firefighting, but you're seeing thousands of people being evacuated and sheltered and, and all the things that go along with that. Uh, it's emergency managers who set that sort of thing up. Uh, when you look at Louisiana, uh, huge work being done by, there by the emergency management folks. And FEMA is, is, is there in force. And then just in the last day, uh, you've got Philadelphia and you've got New Jersey and New York uh, suffering from the uh, latter stages of Hurricane Ivy. More emergency management work going on there. So it's something that there's a, there's a lot of it going on right now. Well, what's the difference between an emergency and a disaster? Let me give you a warning. The explanation that I'm about to give you is just for tonight. <laughs> it's just for this presentation because in, all, in reality, the two words, the two terms, emergency and disaster, they get flipped, uh, switched all the time. They're used interchangeably. Uh, the only reason I'm bringing it up is because I want you to understand the concept, but don't get hung up on the vocabulary. So from the official Jim Yoke Dictionary, I haven't sold any of these yet. An emergency is something that's small. 
somebody falls over and breaks a leg, somebody has a heart attack in the shopping mall, uh, somebody's in a car crash, something small. Mm -hmm. And so um, emergency resources are needed. You might need law enforcement, you might need fire, you might need emergency medical, but there's no shortage of resources to deal with that incident. There's plenty of resources available to deal with that. And so that's what I'm terming as an emergency. A disaster, on the other hand, is something like a wildfire, uh, like we're seeing right now in California, or an earthquake or something where uh, it's so large that it's beyond the capabilities of the jurisdiction and, and demands are overwhelming uh, the supply, overwhelming resources. That, now that's a disaster. Well, in my profession, I'm not worried about the, the emergency. Um, I, I do teach first aid, CPR and AED for the Red Cross to deal with those kinds of things, but, but that's just kind of a side gig for me as a volunteer there. Um, professionally, what I'm concerned about is the disaster. Okay? Now, obviously, like I said, don't get hung up on the vocabulary because if, the vocab if we were really strict about this, instead of having FEMA, you'd have, what would you have? FDMA or something like that, right? Because it, instead of being a emer federal emergency management agency, it would be the federal disaster. So don't worry about the vocabulary, but just get the concept of resources and size. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that I think about when I'm staring at the ceiling at you in the morning? Other than my San Diego Padres who are crashing really fast. Um, these are the things that I think about at two in the morning when I'm staring at the ceiling. I think about the Chevron refinery. And when I think about the Chevron refinery, I'm, what I'm really thinking about are about four different things. Um, I'm thinking about oil spills. I'm thinking about just industrial accidents where somebody made a mistake and you've got a whoopsie and it's bad. Um, I think about um, the Hayward fault line, which is just a very few short miles away from the refinery. And so if the Hayward fault decides to have a really bad day, uh, anywhere that's near the refinery, that's gonna make life exciting. Um, and then lastly, I think about uh, potential terrorist incidents. Um, I, I think about some uh, hateful person or crazy person, whatever case, um, you know, taking a small airplane full of explosives and flying it right into the refinery. Um, these are things that, that uh, concern me and uh, are going to occupy a lot of my planning time in, in the near future. Um, I think about civil disturbances. Uh, we saw a lot of that last summer and not getting into the causes of that. Uh, that's you know, something for this discussion, but just the fact that it happens. Uh, and then, you know, well, not only last summer, but then January 6th. Um, we live in a time right now where we've been going through a lot of this sort of thing. And that's something that concerns me. Cyber attacks. I don't know if you're familiar with this or not. Um, I mean, they, they've been in the news, um, but uh, three years ago, Union City, just down Interstate 80 from here, Union City was um, attacked uh, with a cyber attack and the, and the city for about two or three or four weeks just pretty much ceased to exist. Or, or Well, that's not, let me take that back. It existed, but it wasn't able to function. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, 911 didn't work. Police couldn't go out on calls. Fire couldn't go out on calls. Um, city Hall, you know, all the different offices in City Hall just couldn't work. And it I'm, took I'm sorry, Jim, but the amplitude of your voice is fluctuating yeah. up and down. If you could uh -oh. either get closer to the mic or speak it a bit louder. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank uh, but it, uh, the cyber attack situation is, is obviously something that's of great concern everywhere uh, these days. Uh, and it's, it's something that, that I worry about. Obviously, we have the worst fault line in all of North America going right through Richmond. Um, and actually that's, that's the rare event, but it has the greatest significance. And it's what I worry about uh, the most. Um, flooding, always an issue. Just look at New York today. Um, pandemic, uh, we just finished. Well, I shouldn't say that, we're still in it. What am I saying? We're not done. Uh, we are in a pandemic. Uh, it's not gonna be the last one. Uh, we've had them before. I remember SARS, I remember H1N1. Someday when we are do, done with COVID, there will be more in the future. 
Um, you're familiar with public safety power shutoffs, I'm going to guess. This is where PG&E turns off our power deliberately. But there's also just power outages in general and the fragility of the electrical grid in the United States as a whole. And that's something that affects us. Smoke, air quality index. I was just outside a few minutes ago and I, I could taste the smoke. Uh, it's, it's a little smoky out there, but it's not nearly as bad right now as it was last year. Um, and so we know this can be a serious problem. Terrorism um, in its many forms. Tsunami, I don't know how many people realize this, but uh, we have a tsunami threat here in Richmond. And it's something that the state of California has been beginning to plan for. And I've been in communication with the county and the state to do that. But our marina area is, is vulnerable. Uh, wildfire, which I know is what you people are uh, most concerned about and for good reason. And then what influences just about everything on this list is climate change. Uh, it's real, it's there. It's when I go to conferences and conventions on emer of emergency managers, there are always sessions on climate change. Uh, it's something we talk about constantly, professionally. And it's going to continue to be a problem as time goes by. And it's, and it's, it's getting worse and it's getting worse faster. The, the speed of change is picking up. So that affects us. Now, when you think about emergency management, you think I've, it's, it's, it's organized in five phases. Prevention, typically what we think about with law enforcement and terrorism. Uh, preparedness, uh, this is a place where I spend a lot of my time and effort. Uh, writing plans, putting people through training, putting people through exercises, making sure that facilities are uh, ready the day they're needed, and making sure we have all the supplies and equipment that we need. Mitigation, this is my favorite of the bunch, and I know it's the one that, uh, for just from talking to Sahela, is most important to you. But the whole idea behind mitigation is there are disasters that are inevitable. We know they're going to happen. I'll use earthquake as an example. I know we're gonna have an earthquake one of these days. Hopefully it's long after I've retired, but it could be tomorrow for all I know. So when I think about mitigation, the question is, what can we do as a society, as a community, or what can I do as an individual to mitigate the risk so that when the inevitable earthquake happens, it, the consequences of it won't be so bad? That's what mitigation is all about. We do it as individuals. Uh, for example, in your home, I'm going to guess that your water heater is strapped to the wall. Is that right? Let me see. Ray, yeah, give me, okay, all right, good, good. People, water heaters are strapped to the wall. Well, that is mitigation. You're mitigating the risk because you know the earthquake is gonna come one of these days. And by strapping it to the wall, you're making it more likely that it won't fall over. So that's an example of, of that. When you wildfire, you do a defensible space around your home. You clear the brush around your home so you don't have things that are going to burn. Um, in, in a radius around your home, that's wildfire mitigation on an individual level. But we do it on a community level too. When you see Caltrans retrofitting a bridge or, an, or a freeway overpass, that's a form of community mitigation, right? Where we're recognizing a threat to an entire neighborhood or an entire community, and we're doing something about that threat. So Hala talks about this all the time, when it comes to the community wildfire threat. And what Sahela is trying to do, and Sahela, I don't know if you've actually used this terminology or not, but what Sahela is trying to do is how is to make a difference on the community wildfire threat in your area. And I'm all for it. Uh, the, the classic example that I use all the time of mitigation that didn't happen and people regretted it afterwards was Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans back in 2005 where they knew ahead of time, it was documented that the levees in New Orleans could not handle a major hurricane, but nothing was done to improve the strength and the quality of, of those levees. Hurricane Katrina showed up, New Orleans got wiped out and a whole lot of people died in the process. So it, to me, it's a question of, do we spend a few, and I'm, and I'm using figures here very casually, but do we spend a few million dollars to mitigate a risk uh, in anticipation of the incident, 
or do we ignore it and then spend billions of dollars, which is what we've done in New Orleans, afterwards to repair something that could have been dealt with before the incident, but instead we waited until something really bad after the incident and, and have significant loss of life in the process. So mitigation is something I believe in very, very strongly. Response, uh, this is uh, the fourth out of five. Um, so here we're talking about can people in the field, police officers, firefighters, um, emergency medical people, can they interact with the city or county or state, depending upon what level of government they're dealing with, emergency operations center, uh, which is at city hall, let's say, uh, where at city hall, they're trying to manage everything that's going on in the jurisdiction while individuals at individual incidents are dealing with whatever they're looking at. Uh, that's a big task for emergency management to make sure that we can actually coordinate with each other and communicate and get things done. And then recovery, okay, the sirens have stopped blaring, the lights have stopped flashing, the police officers have gone, the firefighters have gone, but now we have to put the community back together again, which can take years, it can take decades, um, depending upon the type of the incident and how bad the damage was. Uh, when you think about recovery, there's infrastructure, um, you know, Roads got washed out, bridges got washed out. Those need to be repaired. Um, families, um, their home got destroyed. You look, look at what you're seeing in Louisiana right now. You've got thousands and thousands of people where their homes have been completely wiped out. Uh, financial assistance for individual people, but then economic assistance for the general economy. Uh, one of the things that we talk about in my profession from time to time is you know, when the Bay Area, notice when I'm not saying if, when the Bay Area gets hit by a large earthquake, uh, depending upon the length of time needed for recovery, um, how many businesses are just going to say, we're out of here, we're leaving? Um, and this is something, for example, down in Silicon Valley, where you've got Apple, and you've got Google, and Facebook, and Oracle, and Intel, and HP. Um, if those companies decide to just leave, because they can't be down for an extended period of time, they have to be up and running. Uh, this could be a serious economic problem for the entire Bay Area. So recovery is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about as well. I'm all over it. I, I'm, I'm involved in all five of these. So, okay, with those five phases of emergency management in mind, how, am, how are we in the city of Richmond going to address those five phases? And I've got nine things uh, that I'm pursuing in order to do that. One, plan writing. Uh, we have uh, a variety of plans here, uh, and uh, some of them are getting uh, a little older and need to be uh, redone, and so I'm going to get busy doing that. Training. Uh, city staff need to know Obviously, they, they know their day-to-day -day job, but the day a disaster happens, they need to know what to do and how to do it and where to do it. And so I need to put them through training. Uh, and then we put on exercises here at City Hall. So we give people a scenario and we say, this is what has happened. And um, they need to be able to perform under, under those kinds of circumstances. So it's a chance to get some practice doing what they would actually do the day a disaster happens. Facilities. Uh, I could talk about this at great length, but, I, but I'm not going to here. Uh, but we have facilities for shelters. We have facilities for staging materials uh, or, or staging people. We have facilities for housing materials, um, all kinds of facilities that need to be up to date and maintained and ready to go. Uh, we have a lot of supplies and equipment that needs to be inventoried and maintained, especially if it has a shelf life. Um, so those are all things that don't affect you, but now we get into some that do. Community disaster preparedness, getting out into the community, into the public, and talking to residents of Richmond about what they should be doing in their homes in order to be prepared. And I'm going to get, show you how we're going to do that in just a minute. Richmond's volunteer program. Now, you notice I listed community disaster preparedness separately from the volunteer program. And they frequently get blended when people start talking about this subject. Um, and I, I don't blend them. I keep them quite separate because with community disaster preparedness, I'm just going to a group, I'm giving a presentation, I'm saying, here's what you should do, and then we're done. The difference between that and the volunteer program is with the volunteer program, 
they get educated about what they should do to be prepared just like everybody else. But then they take the additional step of saying, I want to get involved. I want to be part of the team. I want to volunteer for my city. So that's the difference. External relationships and partners, agencies that have a role to play. And I'm going to go into those in a few moments and you'll see there's quite a lot of them. Uh, but they're uh, external agencies that we work with uh, and that we need. And then community relationships and outreach. Here I'm talking to agencies where I'm not really expecting them to play a role like I do with the, ex uh, the external partners, but they are really good at promoting what we're doing. And so they're valuable for that reason. Let me get into these nine in a little more detail. And on uh, some that don't affect your group too terribly much, I'll go through more quickly. Some that, uh, there's a couple slides here that really affect your group a lot. I'll spend more time there. But before I do that, a quick detour. You might already know this, but uh, what is an EOC? Um, I don't know if you do or not, So, but it's important because we're gonna talk about it quite a lot. Um, an EOC, it's an emergency operations center. And like I said earlier, let's say after a disaster, let's say Richmond in one neighborhood has a fire in another neighborhood, a building has collapsed in another neighborhood, um, uh, pipes have broken, keep going, keep going. Let's say you've got five or six different things going on in Richmond. Well, in the field, police, fire, and public works personnel will be dealing with each of those incidents, but they're only focused on their incident. They're not paying attention to all the other things that are going on in the city. But at the Emergency Operations Center, which is here at City Hall, this is the hub of activity for the city. And this is where we're looking at all five or six of those things because we're looking at the entire city and what's going on. And so while people in the field are in command, and I use that word very deliberately, of what they're doing uh, at their fire or at their building collapse, at the city and the EOC, we're, our job is to manage everything that's going on. So that's the difference between field command and EOC management. Really important to understand that. So this is the place where things get managed. When we have a really bad day, the key word is managed. I think I just already did all this. Uh, we could have multiple incidents happening simultaneously. So there you go, I already covered all that. So that's what the EOC is, it's at a facility. It's where we gather to do this stuff. Now, I brought that up because I'm gonna be getting back to talking about EOCs in just a moment. Um, all right, what's going on with planning in the city right now? What's, what's going on right now? And what's the plan going forward? Says the man who's been here two and a half months. Um, okay. So plans, they're the foundation of everything, right? I mean, just think about it. When you are making a plan to do something, it's kind of the same concept, right? You're making a plan that's going to, you're figuring out what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, all that sort of thing. So what are the plans that really matter here? Uh, the emergency operations plan is the foundation plan for the city. That's the plan that does everything that was in that larger bullet point uh, above. Uh, who's, who does what, when, where, with what? Et cetera, et cetera. Now, the continu continuity of operations plan is really, really important also because while the city of Richmond is dealing with some kind of incident and lots of Richmond employees and volunteers are busy 24 7 dealing with this bad thing that has happened to the city, well, the city still has to be able to function as a city. You, the city just doesn't shut down, right? The city still has to be able to do things. And so, the continuity of operations plan is where we say, okay, what are the essential functions and the essential personnel in order to keep the city functioning while everybody else is doing dealing with this bad thing that has happened? So that's what that plan is all about. Now, this is the plan that I think is probably going to be most of most interest to you is the local hazard mitigation plan, because this is where in a very formal uh, way where we, we have data and it's documented and it's it's, it's quantitative. I mean, it's, it's got analysis, a lot of analysis. This is where we really get into the details of what are our hazards and how significant are they and, and all the details. Now, the mitigation plan is important for a couple of reasons. One, once you've had a disaster, once something has happened and you're hoping that the state or the feds will come rolling into town with uh, financial assistance, uh, that financial assistance to the city is going to be dependent on 
several things, but one of them is you'd better have a local hazard mitigation plan that has been approved by FEMA. Because if you don't, then you're gonna lose out on uh, significant funding from the federal government. Uh, so that's one reason to have a hazard mitigation plan. The other reason is because, and this gets to what you folks are doing. Um, once you have a hazard mitigation plan, you are then able to start uh, applying for hazard mitigation projects. And I know that this is near and dear to your heart uh, because you folks are looking for projects to do things to mitigate the risk that you're counting, that you're, that you're focused on. Now, we do have a local hazard mitigation plan. In the, and, and it's funny because different counties handle this differently. Um, in this county, um, it's a joint effort uh, between the county and the city. Uh, so I'm not going to be writing Richmond's local hazard mitigation plan by myself. Uh, it's something where I will be working with my counterparts at the county to do that. And, and now um, it exists, it's, it's there, uh, there's already one. Um, I've, but I've been talking to people at the county and I've been told that the time to rewrite, because you have to do it, I, I think it's every five years, I believe, if, if memory serves me right. Um, uh, it's, it's getting to be time, uh, time in that cycle to, um, to, to do a new one. So something to keep our eye on. Uh, recovery plan. Um, I'm not gonna go into great detail here, but it's, it's incredibly important to have a strong recovery plan because uh, millions of dollars are riding on, <laughs> on this particular document. Uh, public assistance, uh, so City Hall is damaged, we need to rebuild City Hall. Individual assistance, thousands of families need help, uh, things along those lines. Um, you need to have a well-written recovery plan uh, in order to do that. And then the last one I'm gonna mention is the debris management plan, uh, and that is something that the city is contracting out um, soon. Uh, the proposal is going to the city council, I think this month. Um, with a particular vendor to do that for us. Debris management, it's a part of the recovery plan is what it is. Uh, the disaster is over with, uh, but um, well, just think about what we see with the wildfires after the fire is done and, and you've got burned out cars all over the place and destroyed homes and all kinds of hazardous materials that were in those homes and, and other kinds of building businesses. Uh, so you need to have a debris management plan because you know, the local garbage truck just isn't going to pull up and take all that stuff away. It's, that's not possible. So this is something that's extremely important for the jurisdiction. Okay, getting into details, I'm gonna go over these slides a little more quickly because they don't affect you a whole lot. But yes, we're gonna put city employees through training and we're gonna put city employees through exercising. So they need to know how to use the EOC. They have to be familiar with that facility. Uh, they have to be really good at something we call the incident command system. And if you ever take any classes from me, you will get pounded with the incident command system. Uh, and then how to be prepared at home. Uh, because if the employees are not prepared at home uh, and they're at work and something bad happens, or if they're at home and something bad happens and they need to come into work, they're going to perform poorly because they're going to be thinking all about how they're not prepared at home. And presumably they have wives and husbands and kids and dogs and cats. Uh, they need to have that squared away in order to be able to function uh, on the job post-disaster. Exercising, uh, we're gonna do a lot of this. We're gonna have drills so they can practice skills. We're gonna have tabletop exercise so we can test plans and policies. Uh, does the plan work? Do we need to change the plan? Tabletop exercises show us that. Functional exercises. This is where we take the EOC and we say, okay, everybody, we're gonna focus on the EOC and see if we can make it work. And here's the exercise. And then full-scale exercises. This is something that we've been talking to Carriage Hills about, uh, but we, we put it on hold for uh, a little while. We're, we're going to do it, but we just have to put it on hold. Um, but this is where we have people in the field. And this is where we have people in the EOC. And we test the ability of those field people, uh, both employees and volunteers, uh, and the EOC to coordinate and communicate and get things accomplished. So that's coming, it's all coming. Okay, this is a big slide for you folks. This one's gonna be important to you. You notice I even put on the top of the slide, this will be huge. Okay, <laughs> I did that just for you. So what are we talking about? What is it that needs to go out to the community? What is the disaster preparedness stop that I, 
need to take on the road? Well, there's several things. First off is we need to have a publicity campaign with the mass notification system. Uh, I hope you're all signed up for Nixle. I hope you're all signed up for the community warning system. And if you're not, that's an easy problem to fix. Um, go to the city's website and you can find out about Nixle. Go to the county's website and you can find out about the community warning system. This is of an enormous importance to me. I, my, my mind goes back to Santa Rosa in 2017, which seems to me like it was just the other day. But the county, Sonoma County, was sending out mass notification warnings, alerts, evacuate, evacuate, fire, fire. But it was midnight. It was one in the morning. A lot of people were in bed. They were asleep. And only a certain percentage of the population had signed up to get these messages anyway, which is normal. That's the way it is everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, so... When Sonoma County did that, some people got the messages and they evacuated, but a lot of people didn't get those messages because they hadn't signed up. So they just stayed fast asleep until their house caught on fire. And unfortunately, a number of those people died. Mass notification saves lives. Okay, I can't make it any blunter than that. So one of the things we're going to do here is go on, go out into the community uh, and we're going to give presentation after presentation after presentation uh, on this subject. And the county is, is involved too. Uh, I've, I've been talking to the county about it. They want to do it as well. So we're going to work together on that. Basic emergency education. We're going to go into the elementary schools and we're going to talk to the students about uh, disaster preparedness at their level. Uh, this is a program that I've given in the past. Um, it's always gone over really well. You know, third graders have the most interesting observations on life, by the way. Um, and so we're going to get out into the schools and we're going to talk to the kids. Um, the only thing that I see slowing this down um, at the moment is COVID. Um, as, as I'm sure you know, the schools are, even without me coming in the door, they're already wrestling with how to handle just conducting school. So um, this might take a little while because the schools might not be ready. Teen CERT. Um, if you're familiar with the CERT program, well, there's also a teen component to it where we can take it to high school students. Um, I've done this before where uh, we train juniors and seniors. And uh, uh, it, depending upon how the school wants to handle it, and different schools handle it differently, in some cases, they're uh, able to be part of that school's emergency response team and actually perform duties if there's an, uh, an incident at the school. Uh, in other schools, they don't want them to do that, but they do like the idea of having the teens being able to help the community. So different schools handle it differently. But it's something where I'm really excited to get uh, getting on the road. Youth amateur radio program. We need youngsters. I don't know how many ham radio operators are on this call, but you'll agree with me that the vast majority of the ham radio population is uh, is, is getting up there and we need kids doing amateur radio. So that's something, uh, there, there are places in the country where they're doing this very successfully. Uh, Fontana, California has a great program. So this is something that, uh, that we can do. Personal emergency preparedness. I already talked about how city employees need this, but we're going to have it for the public as well, have it for all the residents of Richmond. So, um, we will have classes scheduled uh, and promoted that will be here at City Hall uh, or the, uh, or the, or the uh, Civic Center. Um, but we'll also be able to take this on the road. So we could come to your community, your neighborhood, and we can give presentations. Uh, and one of the nice things about personal emergency preparedness presentations is they're really flexible. We can contract them and make, do them in as little as, say, half an hour. We can expand them and make them as long as two hours or even more. Um, it, it all depends on the audience. Listos. Uh, one of the truisms of emergency management and disaster preparedness is that we do a really good job, and we have for decades done a great job preparing people who speak English. We have not done a good job as a profession when it comes to people who do not speak English. Um, so we're making efforts to address that. Listos is a program that was created in Santa Barbara. Um, 
I'm good friends with uh, the people in charge of Listos down there. Uh, I am a Listos instructor. I am bilingual. Uh, I am multilingual. And um, we're going to start addressing the Latino population in Richmond very, very vigorously. And I'm really looking forward to that. And lastly, on my list, uh, sound the alarm. Uh, and I think this may be of interest to you. Um, this is where we go into neighborhoods uh, of significant uh, fire activity. Uh, this is where we go into neighborhoods where uh, we have lots of fires. Um, there's usually a, a socioeconomic component to all this. Um, and uh, Red Cross volunteers, but the city can partner with the Red Cross and make it a joint effort. Um, and we go in and we install smoke alarms in homes that don't have one. And it saves lives. Um, I have done sound the alarm events with the Red Cross before. And uh, it seems like every time we do that, sure enough, a few weeks later, a couple months later, there is a story in the news about how somebody's house caught on fire, but they all got out. Uh, and the reason they got out is because we installed smoke alarms in their home. And when you see that, it makes you feel really good. It's like you did something really worthwhile that day. Okay, volunteer disaster service programs. I think this is also going to be a big slide for you folks. So community emergency response team. I don't know how familiar you are with this, but CERT is where we take people who learn about disaster preparedness, but then want to go take the next step and actually become volunteers for the city. So they've learned disaster preparedness. They learn fire safety. They learn how to use extinguishers. Um, they learn uh, disaster medical operations, which is different from first aid, by the way. Um, medical operations in the midst of a disaster is, is different from somebody falls over on the street and they need help, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, they learn damage assessment. They learn light search and rescue, how to go into a lightly damaged building and do search patterns and find people who are trapped and get them out. Um, they learn a lot of interesting things in Insert. And then once they graduate, they become part of the city's team. And this is something that's a, an area of huge emphasis for me because Richmond has had CERT for quite some time. But in all honesty, it's quite disorganized. We have neighborhoods acting very independently. There's not a centralized CERT program that represents the city. Um, I've been talking to the volunteers about this, and they're, uh, they, I've been telling them, you need structure, you need organization. Um, and they're on board with that. They, they agree. <laughs> they're like, yes, we need that. Yes. So we're getting, getting the program better organized. But then we're also going to have to do a whole lot of training. And COVID had a big influence on this because there has not been a whole lot of training, or hasn't, excuse me, there hasn't been any training going on since 2019. So we're getting the program organized and we're going to get busy with training. And it's something I think you folks really want to do. So, hey, I saw your name on a list. You've gone through this training, right? Yep. I saw your name. Okay. Amateur Radio Emergency Service, which is called ARIES, and Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, which is called RACES. These are two organizations uh, established by the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, to provide emergency radio services across the United States of America. Uh, again, this is a question in Richmond of organization and structure because we have lots and lots and lots of radio operators um, in Richmond. Um, but it's, again, like CERT, it's disorganized. Um, and they're all kind of out there doing their own thing. So uh, I am bringing it all together. And Aries and Racy's are the two ways we're going to do that so that... Um, instead of just floating around out there kind of aimlessly, um, they're gonna be part of a city organization. Medical Reserve Corps. I don't know if we have any doctors or nurses on the call right now, but uh, this was something that was set up by Health and Human Services and the Department of Homeland Security. Um, oh gosh, I wanna say about 15, 20 years ago. It was in the, this is one of the many things that happened after the September 11th disaster. Um, and it's a great program where we can take medical people and organize them uh, along with uh, under, under the leadership of uh, county public health departments and also under the uh, above that, the leadership of the California Emergency Medical Services Association, CalEMSA. Um, 
And then above that, you get into Washington, D.C. Um, but Medical Reserve Corps personnel are so valuable uh, because, number one, uh, they are deployable around the state and around the nation uh, if need be and if, the, if they're willing. I mean, you don't, you don't get deployed unless you want to. Uh, they, they don't kidnap you. Uh, uh, but then they're also really valuable locally. The day, that, the day we have our earthquake here in Richmond, which we know is coming someday, uh, if we have Medical Reserve Corps volunteers here in Richmond, uh, they're going to be particularly helpful because while our CERT volunteers are setting up treatment areas for people who are injured, the Medical Reserve Corps people will join them, but they will join them at a higher level of training. That's the thing, but the CERT people are lay public, right? Well, they and, and they're going to be trained to a certain level of medical operations. But Medical Reserve Corps volunteers, because they come at this from a profession, the medical profession, they will be able to join them and do things at a higher skill level than the CERT volunteers will be able to do. I love Medical Reserve Corps. External relationships. Okay, I'm almost done. Whoosh. Uh, so these are people, these are groups that have a role to play. These are groups where I want action to happen. Okay, so I wrote, we help them and they help us. So schools, schools are really important. They act as shelters. So that's something they do uh, to benefit the community, but also their plans. Schools have emergency plans and there's specific uh, rules and requirements placed on them by the California Department of Education on what their plans should look like. And schools are continually asking for help on this um, because this is not something that school teachers you know, learn when they go to, go to college and get their uh, teaching credential. Uh, this is where they need help from emergency management. And so we'll be, uh, we're not gonna do the job for the schools. Um, that would not be possible. There's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, but uh, we can, but I'll certainly be working with the schools to get them guidance on this. And then lastly, schools are great as an information conduit. Every time I give a B presentation in an elementary school, I'm going to be telling kids that, hey, when you go home and you say, mom and dad, this is what I want you to tell them, right? And, and they are very good at doing that. Um, and then and the same thing to the community, right? Schools are great information conduits. Places of worship. So, uh, I'll be working with these people. They need to be prepared internally for their congregations that in case something happens while their, their place of worship is full of 300 and some odd people. But also places of worship like schools, like schools are of great assistance externally to the neighborhood and the community. They can act as shelters, for example. There are things that they can do to help the neighborhood and help the community. Chamber of Commerce uh, business community. So one of the things that has been long, long documented for many, many years is the percentage of businesses in a community that fail and go out of business because they went through a major disaster. And the percentage is very, very high, okay? If you look at what's going on in Louisiana right now, one of the things, one of the many things that's happening there is businesses are going belly up and they will never, ever, ever come back. And so not only does New Orleans and, and the rest of the state need to uh, recover from what happened to them a few days ago, physically, you know, rebuilding things, um, but also uh, sales tax revenue and business activity is going to take a major, major hit across the entire state. So, but if businesses are prepared ahead of time, okay, and if they've gone through some training on how to prepare for an emergency, their chances of success aren't going to be a guarantee by any stretch, that would be crazy, but they'll certainly be a lot better than they would have been if they hadn't done anything at all. So we'll be working there. Licensed senior residential communities. So skilled nursing facilities, assisted care living facilities. They have to be able to take care of their people uh, when there's an emergency. They have a legal requirement to do that. And that includes being able to evacuate their people uh, if the facility requires it. So we'll be working with them to make sure that they actually can do it. Hey, there's a fun acronym. You know, if you go to Google and you put that in the search bar, you'll get it. It stands for Bay Area Urban, Bay Area, Urban Area Security Initiative. Um, every metropolitan area in the United States has a UASI, 
Okay, that's how we say it. That's that's how we pronounce it. Uh, and then ours is Bay Area UAS. Uh, this is something that was set up by the Department of Homeland Security following the September 11th disaster 20 years ago. Um, and it's a funding source and a training source and a coordination source. We get lots and lots and lots of stuff from Bay Area UASI here in the city of Richmond. Uh, lots of classes that are available. They organize exercises that encompass the entire Bay Area. Uh, they do a lot of great work there. I'm, I love those guys. Uh, they're housed over in San Francisco. That's where their, their offices are. County Office of Emergency Services, very good friends. That's our, those are our county, Contra Costa County counterparts. They're in Martinez uh, and they organize the county. Uh, so along with all the other cities and park districts and you name it, uh, uh, where do we gather? Where do we meet? It's the County Office of Emergency Services. Here's a big one for all of us in Richmond. Um, you may already be familiar with this. Um, but this is, uh, CARE is the organization that is set up between the county and uh, the petrochemical people in the county, which includes Chevron. Um, our community warning system is something that uh, they, they, they got going. Uh, and they, they do a lot of work because, uh, you know, they recognize the need. And, and uh, they're very good partners, very good partners. American Red Cross. So um, here in Richmond and, and here in Contra Costa County, we are part of the Bay Area chapter, which includes Alameda, Contra Costa, San Francisco, and San Mateo counties, those four counties. Uh, and then within each of those four counties, there's a leadership council. I am on the Contra Costa Leadership Council. And there, you know, earlier I was talking about Sound the Alarm program with the Red Cross installing smoke alarms. It's that leadership council that I'll be working with to make that happen here in Richmond. Uh, right now, there are, we are organizing a blood drive that's going to be at the Veterans Hall on September 21. So uh, look for the flyers and go give blood on the 21st. Bay Area CERT Coalition. These are the CERT programs from all around the Bay Area. And this is where we coordinate and trade ideas and information. It's very, very valuable. Contra Costa County has the same kind of thing. Uh, there's a CERT group uh, and Richmond is a part. So this is where we get to talk to San Ramon and uh, Walnut Creek and Martinez and uh, you know on and on. And now I'm going to guess that at least some of you and maybe all of you uh, once a year in October have participated in the great California shakeout where we all at a predetermined date and time, dive under our desks and practice uh, drop, cover, and hold. Let me see hands. Have people, have, have people experienced this or have you never heard of it? Oh my God, Joni, you've never heard of it? Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, well, it's something that we do in California, millions of us. <laughs> Once a year in October, we all drop, cover, and hold at the same time. The Earthquake Country Alliance is the organization that created that and, and manages it. And, and I'm a part of their, their group. I'm on, I'm on their, uh, their organization. So those are really good partners. Now, community outreach, I said earlier, those, these folks all have a role to play, right? They have work to do. And then we work with them. Well, these folks, it's just lots of good publicity is really all it, boils, all, all it is. Um, neighborhood councils. Very familiar here in uh, Richmond. Um, I have yet to begin, but it's going to start very, very soon. Very, very soon. Uh, I'm going to start visiting neighborhood councils all over the place. And then, of course, there's the uh, citywide uh, consortium. I'm, I'm, I'm messing up the name, but the, the, the citywide group where all the councils come together. Uh, they're going to get to know me really well. Uh, Kiwanis, uh, we have an active Kiwanis in Richmond. Uh, that's always a good group to be involved with. And then likewise, Rotary. So when it comes to getting the information out, uh, like I just gave you about what is emergency management doing? What does emergency management look like? Where are we going with this program? These are all really good places to uh, get that information out. And there you go. Woof. 
you've all survived. Thank you very much, Jim. It was impressive. Thank you. Very <laughs> systemic way of defining the problem and then approaching possible solutions. I'm very grateful. I only have about 10 or 12 questions for you. But before I share my questions, I'm going to ask. It sounds, like we, it, it sounds like we need to go have lunch. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, I, I'm going to ask others if they have questions. And I know we usually have our meetings for an hour. This is going to be um, unusually longer. You're welcome to stay or you're welcome to leave for dinner if you wish. But um, Joni, please go ahead with your question or comment. Well, I because I have to go to another meeting at seven. So thank you for giving me the chance to say thank you, Jim. I'm Part of the Greenbrier Neighborhood Council, we've already broken up into block captains. We're working on Ready Together. We'll love to have you and or whatever coordination we can do. And we're already working on it. And so, Hela, thanks as always for organizing us. But I'll look forward to that, Jim, and I'll help coordinate you with our committee, okay? Are you, go are you going to give me a phone call or send me an email? I'll put it in the chat right now, and certainly I'll, I took yours down, and I will, okay? Okay. Thank I, you. I, I, I want to be there. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Joni. Um, any other questions? Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to go with my questions, and if anybody has questions, please raise your hands, and I'll let you go. My main question, Jim, is about the county and city cooperation. In our area, as you know, two streets up, two streets down is county. We cannot get organized without our county neighbors. They don't even have neighborhood um, councils organized. Karen Fenton here, who is organizing actually radio operators, and thank you for joining us, Karen, is trying to define neighborhoods within the county so the entire 94803 area will have different um, localities that can connect together. So I would like to ask you to please find ways that at all these levels of preparedness and everything, if we could um, coordinate with county, I don't know how it goes financially, like you could get a portion of their budget and get over 94803, how you're gonna coordinate it, but this is our major concern. Well, I talk to the county on a regular basis, but I am not in a position to commit them, uh, commit you know what they will do. I, I'm not part of their decision making. So we 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 work together uh, frequently on different things, but uh, you know I, I can't obligate them to this task or that task. I can, I can certainly make recommendations. I can I can request things, but it's their decision what they do. Just like it's our decision here, what we do. I understand, but we as residents would like to see the cooperation. So we're going to ask them for such cooperation. And we are asking you, and we hope at the end there will be some cooperation. I asked the supervisor, Joya, actually, to include the notifications about community warning system uh, along with the tax bills. Everybody receives it. So because we mm. don't have enough number of people, we don't have a test of it yet. So he said he's looking into it and talking to the tax collector's office. So hopefully we'll have more people enrolled in CWS so we can have a test of it. And um, that, that, that's very important for us. Another um, question I have for you, is there a fire break around the refineries? Like if there is a wildfire in the city, are they gonna be safe because of if, if fire reaches them, it's going to make things like 100 times worse. Or if the, there's a terrorist attack on them, as you suggested, then the city will be in danger. Is there any barrier for the fire between the refinery and the city? I'm not in a position to say with any authority. Uh, there are other people who know more about the subject than I do. I was out there last week uh, meeting with their fire chief and their fire department. Uh, and I did get a chance to uh, see the property. Um, it was my first time there, uh, not my last. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really not in a position of expertise to, to say one way or the other. I, 
I think that the answer to your question is yes, but don't quote me on that, please, because uh, I would want to do more research on that. Okay, maybe we should work with the fire marshal to make sure there is a fire barrier. Going back to the previous point about community warning system, actually, Richmond has an office for the rentals and tenants that is very active. Maybe mm -hmm. we could um, require all the landlords to inform their tenants about Nexel and CWS. Send me an email on that. Okay. And, I'll, and, and I, I can certainly ask. Thank you. Sounds like, a, sounds like a good idea to me. Yes. And also, I wonder if your office has budget or could apply for grants to give like $500 to each school to start a radio club or each neighborhood council to buy handheld radios so they can communicate post disaster. Uh, I think my budget, which uh, is not large, uh, is pretty much all spoken for. Jim, Measure X has lots of money. Are we asking for any portion of it? You know, I listened to their meeting uh, last night uh, while I was driving home, uh, but it was not a very informative meeting. Uh, I, I wasn't informative at all, uh, for me anyway. Um, so uh, that's another subject that I'm not in a position to offer any opinions on. Um, okay, but I, I don't have enough information. Are, are you in a position to apply for money from them? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, we need yeah. to look into it. Um, and I have one more suggestion for you. One of the members of 94803 Emergency Preparedness Alliance told me that people in uh, Marine and Sonoma County, they get a free evacuation tag. So in case of a disaster, when they leave, they have that tag at home. So it reduces the work of the police department and people who are doing the evacuation a lot simpler and easier. They already oh, it's like something they put in the front window or something? Exactly, in front of the house or wherever. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems um, a bit easier. When, when you look at your uh, wildfire booklets that our department uh, produced, uh, you'll notice there's uh, one of those inside that booklet. Oh. For each, yeah. Oh, okay, I never noticed it. Yep. Okay. Um, another concern is about having the residents a role um, in cooperation with your office, we had suggested an emergency preparedness commission before. It hasn't been actualized yet, but if is there any way that some residents could be closely working with your office? Or you said there's a plan with the county. Um, to be honest with you, we don't trust is adequate enough until we see it. So it'd be nice to have some residents' eyes on things. Is there any way for that? Uh, I, I'm not sh quite sure I understand what you're asking. Uh, you said the city and county have um, have a plan, all the plans and everything. We don't know if there's such a plan or not. You say there's a plan, County Office of Emergency Services says they have a plan, but we don't know what the plan is. Is it adequate? Is it sufficient? Is it effective? <laughs> it, it'd be nice to, no offense, uh, with all due respect, you know, we see disasters around the country, around the world of the scale of first ever, never been like that. So we would like to make sure that um, things are in place, tied together, nothing will fall in the cracks. Is there any way for that? Wow, I don't know. I'd have to go through my hierarchy on that one. Um, this was an issue... Um, uh, for example, after uh, September 11th. Um, keep in mind, different jurisdictions have different uh, different abilities uh, at, at releasing stuff because um, you go to a simple bedroom community where the emergency plan is a very simple document and it's quite often posted on their website for anybody to look at who wants to. Then there are other jurisdictions where there's some sensitive information inside those emergency plans that they don't want released to the public for obvious reasons. Uh, there were court cases after September 11th on this subject. And what the courts ruled was that yes, this is public information, uh, uh, but uh, it was also, they, they, they kind of, but they, they, they tried to satisfy both sides. They said, yes, these are public documents and public information, 
but uh, the jurisdiction uh, was allowed to redact uh, all sorts of things that um, they felt necessary to redact. Uh, because there's certain things where, you know, especially when we're dealing with terrorism type things, uh, there are things where we don't want, uh, we don't want the bad guys to be, uh, you know, looking at something. So it kind of went both directions after September 11th. I perfectly understand, but let me give you a simple example. For example, you say you have ambitious plan to make Nexol more widespread and community warning system. We don't know what percentage of the population have it. We don't know your timeline. How can we check in six months or a year? We have no data. You see what I'm saying? It'd be nice to know where things are, how things are moving. Are we reaching our goals? Do we need to press the city for more money towards this emergency preparedness? Well, That's it sounds great. like you need. It, 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 it sounds like you need to become my volunteer. So. <laughs> I'll be more than happy to do so. That's why we suggested having a commission. You know, so no, we, no, you just come work with me. Okay, I'll I'll be more than happy. So we'll be in close contact. So Sahel is talking about an audit of your job. That's. <laughs> That's exactly what she's doing. Yeah, I know. The, Gary the, the is an guy, auditor. The, 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 yes, Gary, you're right. That's exactly what she's saying. And she's trying to audit the poor guy who's been here a whopping 10 weeks. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not talking about auditing. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, we, we no, need the question, to on between authorities and residents, both uh, increasing public awareness. Sahela, Sahela, <laughs> let me make a promise to you, okay? I will... Because and I'm making the same promise to everybody in Richmond, so it's not just you. But as as I progress uh, in this new position, initiating things from the beginning, right? So these are things that are just getting pen is meeting paper now, right? Um, I pr absolutely promise to keep you informed as to what's going on and when and you know all that kind of stuff. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. The personally, I have absolute trust in you. And really, you, you're off to a great start. And I wish you the best of success. That sincerely, you're, you have exceeded um, at least my personal expectations very much. I'm very pleased. And thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. And we look forward to having you all oh. again. Yeah, we have more questions. Have you talked to ABAG? Have you had any communication with ABAG? Not for a long time. They used to do a lot of uh, training and they used to uh, do a lot of planning, um, especially in coordination with the USGS in Menlo Park. And uh, many, many years ago, I spent a lot of time at their offices in Oakland on that kind of stuff. But ABAG hasn't been very involved for quite a long time. Well, I mean, so I ordered the reconstruction of the Cypress Freeway and the, and the reconstruction of the... Uh, Fred's retrofit program in the state. And there was a lady there at the time, and so this is going back in to the 90s. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I know that she re retired soon after we finished our audit. Um, we didn't audit ABAG, but what I do know is uh, there was a significant, real significant. Um, uh, coordination effort between all the potential um, organizations that would be brought in for a major earthquake. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the main if the main focus yep. was on earthquake response. I, I was there. Yep. Yeah. So so I don't know, like I said, what you know how well that's been carried on because that lady, it was her passion. Mm -hmm. I don't know whoever, you know, if they, a lot of these things are all relative to the individuals involved. When they move on, uh, a lot of that doesn't get backfilled. Well, yeah, you're right. And and I, I remember very clearly 10, 12, 13 years ago, uh, ABAG did a lot. And I, like I said, I spent an awful lot of time in their offices in Oakland back in those days. Um, well, then you're familiar with them. <laughs> oh, very much so. Very much so. Uh, that work still continues, but it's done mainly by Barry Uwasi. Uh, and then the USGS hasn't gone anywhere. They're, they're still there. And, and 
I don't know if I brought it up. I, I may have left this out, but uh, the haywired uh, research work uh, done by the USGS is golden. The, the, I, I cannot say enough about the great work that the USGS has done uh, on analysis of the Hayward Fault and the consequences of an earthquake on that fault. Uh, it's great, great, great uh, scientific work that they've done. And it, it's great scientific work, and it's also very, very applicable for people like me. Right. Good to know. Okay, well, I wish you all the luck. Um, you got a big job ahead of you. Uh, there's never, su there, there's no such thing as a boring day here. <laughs> You're yeah. so happy you're yeah. in this position, Jim. We, we, we truly are. Thank you so much. And I'll make sure I'll, I'll put you in touch with the president of all the neighborhood councils in 94803 area. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, uh, another thing to keep in mind, uh, th there are things, not, uh, this isn't true for everything, but there are things where uh, we work very closely with uh, our counterparts in El Cerrito and Kensington and San Pablo and, and you know, other neighboring communities. Uh, so that's another thing to you know, think about as well. Okay. I, I talk to my counterparts in those communities all the time. Very so good. Is your office within the, within the fire department or are you a completely separate organization? I am within the fire department uh, here at uh, the Civic Center Plaza. Yes. Okay. Karen, would you like to say something? Karen Fenton? I'm supposed to be the fly on the wall. <laughs> I'm watching, I'm watching his back and helping him and making sure he doesn't fall too far downstairs. Um, yeah, um, no, I, I learned a lot tonight. Thanks, Jim. And, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think you're getting no sleep or food because, well, you're looking, you're looking good. Um, I was a little surprised that there is such a thing as a, a county cert. Uh, everything, I've been a member of the community cert in Richmond since 2008 training. And everything we've done in Richmond has been done collaboratively between the neighborhoods. So we, we, just like the neighborhood councils, we collaborate pretty well. And we've also expanded uh, this collaboration out of necessity, especially with the COVID to the other cities, as you mentioned, just as you work with your counterparts in El Cerrito and Kensington and San Pablo. Well, we do too. We, we, do not worry about city lines or neighborhood lines. We coordinate really well together. But I was a little surprised that we that there is such a thing as a cert. Um, I, I forgot what term you used. It's in my notes. Cert coalition. Oh, coalition. Never heard of it. Never been invited. What we do is we, if some city is having a training and they got room in their Zoom session or they have room in their auditorium they let us in too. So we have trained and advanced trained the few of us um, across the cities, across the county, uh, between Alameda and Contra Costa. The problem that you pointed out with not just the radio stuff is that a lot of us are getting ancient and it's really hard to, to um, generate fresh blood. So I think your idea is great. Um, I'm curious to know how, when you say we, how big your team is, and it has to be volunteer because you can't, you don't have the personnel, time, or funds to do all the great things in your list. I'm curious to know what your timeline is, what you're prioritizing of all these major things. We're just a small portion. The volunteers are a small contribution to your major job, your major assignment. So I'm curious to know your timeline or what you're prioritizing and who, when you say we, to do all these great things like working with the high schools and talking to those elementary schools. I mean, we are we cloning you? Are we gonna have a dozen Jim Yokes um, 
And we'll, we'll be very happy to have that, but I, I don't think it's realistic. So some of those things I, I'm interested to watch. I don't want to hear any answers. I'm going to watch like a fly on the wall and pitch in and rev up our troops because I'm a community organizer like Sohela, except I'm re ready to retire finally to, to help you, to back you up. Okay, that's being the end. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, we are grateful for you joining us tonight. And more than that, we are really grateful for all the great work we're do you're doing for the community. Well, and, thank uh, you. Yeah. And, we and both like we said yesterday when we were uh, texting each other, uh, do this again somewhere down the road. Every and it'll six be months. And it'll be, it'll be different. Yeah, we'll have you over every six months. It, so let's stay in close contact. And if you need volunteers, let me know. I'll be more than happy to volunteer with your office. Anything needs to get done, I can be of help. I'll, I'll be there. We'll okay. Be close contact. Sounds good. I will keep you informed as to what's going on. Great. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Okay.